After years of being known more for promises than actions, Blue Origin finally rolled its big new Glenn rocket into position at Launch Complex 36, a clear sign of its commitment to launch later in 2024. However, just as everything seemed set for takeoff, complications arose with the FAA's latest update on the launch license, casting a shadow over their plans. It would be a bitter pill for Blue's founder Jeff Bezos, because if the inaugural flight slips to January 2025, it risks being completely overshadowed by SpaceX's spectacular Starship Flight 7. Find out everything in today's episode. After lifting vertically at Launch Complex 36 on November 21st night, Blue Origin's New Glenn rocket once again raised hopes in the space community for its first launch this year. New Glenn was initially announced in September 2016, with an ambitious target for its first flight by 2020. Despite the initial enthusiasm, New Glenn faced multiple delays due to technical complexity, funding priorities, and shifts in strategy. The launch window was first pushed back to late 2021, then to the fourth quarter of 2022, and now with recent updates, a launch is anticipated before the end of 2024. While some space enthusiasts are skeptical about that launch window, the company has demonstrated its progress by saying that the rocket is literally on the pad, now waiting for regulatory approval. To add to the certainty, Christian Davenport, the reporter for The Washington Post, announces feasible that FAA grants approval for a December launch of the inaugural flight of New Glenn. But he is also a down-to-earth person, by reminds us that the launch date is tight. The FAA approval is within reach but not yet certain as BO still faces some work ahead. He has a point because prior to launch, the new Glenn has to overcome an important rocket engine test, called the static fire test. We know that a static fire test of the first stage's seven BE-4 engines is one of the final milestones before a launch. More importantly, as Blue Origin CEO Dave Limp shared, this hot fire test also needs the FAA's green light besides the launch license approval, making matters much more complicated. Perhaps witnessing the launch is still a long way off. In the meantime, the vehicle's first stage, or GS-1, has been experiencing the chilling phase or propellant loading test. This marks the first time they are tanking the first stage with liquefied natural gas, LNG, as fuel and liquid oxygen, LOX. Then Dave added, the first stage LOX tank is nearly 30,000 cubic feet and the LNG tank is almost 25,000 cubic feet, equivalent to about 24 and 20 tanker trucks respectively. GS-1 tanking during the NG-1 launch will only take about 30 minutes. Due to engine consumption during boost, it drains in just 3.5 minutes. If the granted license cannot be done in December, the next launch window could be January, the same time as SpaceX Starship Flight 7. Flight 7's updated timeline was disclosed in a NASA document submitted to the FAA. According to the report, a specially equipped aircraft will deploy to Perth, Australia, on January 3, 2025, in preparation for Starship's Flight 7, targeted for January 11, 2025. NASA's mission is to observe Starship's re-entry and peak heating phases, with the spacecraft expected to splash down in the eastern Indian Ocean roughly an hour after launch. The document also highlights collaboration with Australia's Civil Aviation Safety Authority, CASA, which has agreed to honor FAA exemptions under the Melbourne Oceanic Centre's jurisdiction for this mission. While New Glenn's maiden launch is stuck on the ground, Starship's seventh launch is on track to launch early next year. Particularly, its hardware, Booster 14, has already undergone a few critical tests. First of all, there is an igniter test on December 8th. An igniter test of a Starship booster is when SpaceX fires most or all of the Raptor engines at the same time to simulate their performance and ensure that no problems occur during launch. Another type of engine test that has also been conducted recently is a spin prime test, as the engines shoot out liquid oxygen to spin the pumps without ignition. Following the test, 
SpaceX is in readiness for a speculated static fire test during the next road closure, scheduled for Monday. A static fire test is a test in which the first stage engines are ignited, fired, but the vehicle does not launch. It remains static, hence static fire. It's safe to say that New Glenn's inaugural flight is a big matter not only for Blue Origin, but also for the space industry in general. Firstly, the New Glenn's inaugural flight will carry one of the company's new Blue Ring spacecraft on a national security space launch certification flight known as Dark Sky One and sponsored by the Defense Innovation Unit. Blue Ring's end-to-end -end services will seamlessly connect ground and space communications to support a variety of missions on orbit. The Dark Sky One mission will demonstrate Blue Origin's flight systems, including space-based processing capabilities, telemetry, tracking, and command hardware, and ground-based radiometric tracking. The lessons learned from this DS-1 mission will provide a leap forward for Blue Ring and its ability to provide greater access to multiple orbits, bringing the company closer to its vision of millions of people living and working in space for the benefit of Earth. The first launch's success will be proof of guarantee for the rocket's ability to launch NASA's Twin Escapade Mars Probe's mission, which is scheduled for spring 2025 at the earliest. Additionally, New Glenn should come online as soon as possible since it has contracts with entities like Eutelsat and Amazon's Project Kuiper for satellite launches, indicating a robust future launch manifest. The rocket's 7-meter fairing allows for the deployment of multiple satellites in a single launch, making it particularly attractive for companies looking to expand their satellite networks. For instance, AST Space Mobile recently secured a multi-launch agreement with Blue Origin to deliver its next-generation Block 2 Bluebird satellites, essential for providing global cellular broadband coverage. This partnership underscores New Glenn's potential to support ambitious projects that aim to enhance connectivity worldwide. Like SpaceX, Blue Origin has been selected as a contender for the Pentagon's $5.6 billion national security space launch phase three contracts along with SpaceX and United Launch Alliance. The contract is a big win for Blue Origin, marking the first time the space company founded by billionaire Jeff Bezos has been selected to launch sensitive national security satellites. SpaceX and ULA, a Boeing Lockheed Martin joint venture, have had a lock on national security launch contracts under the Phase II program that began in 2020. Furthermore, BO has more ambitions for its big rocket, with the vision of millions of people living and working in space. For example, a reusable heavy-lift rocket will deliver heavy elements of a commercial space complex named Orbital Reef, developed by Blue Origin and Sierra Space. The two privately owned aerospace companies said they will work with Boeing, Redwire Space, Genesis Engineering, and Arizona State University to design, develop, build, and operate the Orbital Reef Space Station. It is architected as a mixed-use business park 250 miles above Earth for commerce, research, and tourism by the end of this decade. The station is being designed to support 10 persons in 830 cubic meters of volume. Also, some expect New Glenn's entry to compete with SpaceX's Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy potentially ushering in an era of industrialization and space exploration. Last but not least, New Glenn's development and operation will play a vital role in national defense amid China's growing willingness to challenge the U.S. in space. The Vice Chief of Space Operations for the U.S. Space Force, General Michael Getline, issued a stark warning about China's accelerating advances in space technology and its growing capacity to challenge the United States' dominance in orbit. Speaking on December 7 at the Reagan National Defense Forum in Simi Valley, California, Guitlein described the evolving space environment as increasingly hostile, marked by the erosion of long-standing norms and the emergence of new threats to U.S. space assets. The adversary is quickly shrinking that gap and we have got to change the way we approach space pretty rapidly," Gwetline said. 
Today that capability gap is in our favor. But if it goes negative on us, it's going to be a really bad day. China's space ambitions have been well documented in recent years. Beijing has launched a record number of satellites and demonstrated technologies like satellite grappling arms and orbital debris removal systems, which could be repurposed as weapons. Its military space program has developed anti-satellite weapons, advanced satellite jammers, and other capabilities designed to disrupt U.S. satellites, critical to navigation, communication, and missile defense. Experts say such capabilities could undermine the United States' ability to project power in a conflict. On November 30th, a Long March 12 carrier rocket successfully sent two experimental satellites into their planned orbits from Hainan Commercial Spacecraft Launch Site, China's first commercial spacecraft launch site in Wenchang, a coastal city in southern Hainan province. The mission marked both the maiden flight of the Long March 12 carrier rocket and the first launch mission of the commercial spacecraft launch site. In response, Guetline emphasized that addressing the threat will require a fundamental shift in how the United States approaches space operations, especially given the Space Force's relatively modest budget and size. Key to this strategy, he said, will be closer collaboration with international allies and commercial industry. A break from Cold War era thinking when the Pentagon was largely self-reliant. In the past, we didn't believe we could count on our commercial partners and international partners during times of crisis, Gultlein said. That has completely changed. Central to this new approach is the Space Force's proposed Commercial Augmentation Space Reserve, CASR, program. Under KASR, private companies would contractually commit to providing satellite services to the military during emergencies, even if it means prioritizing military needs over commercial customers. Guitlin described this as a cost-effective way to ensure access to critical space capabilities during crises. We're trying, with very limited resources, to get after an enormous demand signal coming out of our joint force, he said. However, the program has yet to award contracts and details about its funding and scope remain unclear. Representative Rob Whitman, who also spoke at the Reagan Forum, expressed strong support for KSR, emphasizing its importance in leveraging commercial and allied capabilities to maintain a strategic edge. It shouldn't just be about satellite services, Whitman said. We have to make sure it includes launch vehicles. We have to make sure that our reserve is there to where, if called upon tomorrow, we could respond at the speed of relevance. Whitman urged the Space Force to ensure the program is comprehensive and prepared to respond to threats swiftly. He said the urgency is compounded by China's growing willingness to challenge the U.S. in space. Guitlein's warning comes as the Space Force continues to advocate for more funding and resources to address these threats. We must act now to ensure that the capability gap doesn't shrink to zero or worse, go negative," Getline said. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you next time.